This is episode three of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A. J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorillas with two R's and two L's. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash S A J Johnson. And thanks for listening. Tell a friend. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 5. Live in the Dream. Fall 2015. As the doorbell chimed, Casey barked, skittered over the wood floor, and sprinted to the door. She poked her nose into the small window on the side of the door to look up at the intruder. Her tail wagged so violently that her back feet started to slip. Eric walked towards the door. Who's that, Casey? Okay, back, sit. He continued, but it was no use, of course. His tan mutt knew all kinds of commands and obeyed him when there was the slightest chance of food being involved. He and Lauren usually described her as a mix of chow, shepherd, and something small. Eric opened the door to find Sonny standing on his porch. Come on in, he said. How was the drive? How's Kate? How'd the interview go? Slow down, Sonny smiled through his salt and pepper beard. About eight years older than Eric, he was calmer, and if Eric was describing him to others, the smartest member of their graduating cohort. Of average height and build, Sonny had been starting to complain about aches and pains, but he kept himself in decent shape even though he had an office job for most of the year. Yeah, yeah. Is that all you brought? Eric motioned to Sonny's duffel bag and satchel. Well, it's just an overnight trip. Fair enough. I'll show you to your room and give you the nickel tour. Eric brought him upstairs to the guest room, showing him the room's individual heater and pointing out a bag of goodies he was to take back with him to Chicago. It's just soap, some preserves, venison jerky, sun-dried tomatoes, a loaf of bread, oh, and a jar of honey. I've been looking at your bee photos all summer on Facebook. Kate'll flip for the honey. The soap is only middling. It was our first try at that, but the rest of the stuff is old hat. You have too much free time. Yeah, being chronically underemployed will do that to you. Having a job isn't all that it's cracked up to be. I go back and forth on that idea. Speaking of which, how was the interview? Let's wait until we can sit and drink something before we talk about it. Eric frowned briefly before recovering. Sure, yeah. Uh, Let me show you the rest of the place. Eric was proud of his house. Even though it was only a tenth of an acre in a dense urban St. Louis neighborhood, he and his wife produced quite a bit of their own food, especially in the summer and fall. He showed Sonny the drip irrigation system fed off of rain barrels, saying that if he had to do it again, he'd just go for hand watering because it gave him a chance to monitor the plants more closely. Plus, the built-in irrigation system had many components and points of potential failure. After the first season, some of the pipes hadn't been flushed and they cracked when temperatures dropped below freezing. Part of the reason he had built it was to make chores easier on Lauren when he went to the field. Both Sonny and Eric were archaeologists and spent much of each summer away from home. Sonny sat down at the picnic table on the back porch and popped open the beers he had grabbed from the kitchen. Eric, are you really done with academia? Eric sat on the bench opposite Sonny and took a long pull from the brown bottle offered to him. I'm done with applying for professorships, which means I'm done going to the field. Nobody will fund me without a tenure-track job, which you can't get without having a record of funding. Right. And it doesn't mean I'm giving up on research or writing. I'm just going to pursue it in a different way. Plus, I was starting to really question the value of international travel and expenditure of resources for my somewhat selfish research. Sonny had been looking over the garden, but now I turned to face Eric. Selfish? Sure, it was purely academic. Don't get me wrong, great things can come from that type of research, but I feel like I need to do something more practical, something that uses more of my skills, and something that is more of a direct benefit to those around me. What about teaching? Isn't that a direct benefit? In some sense, and to some students, yes, but most of them are there just to get a BA, in order to get a job. If students were showing up to learn how to think and express themselves, it'd be a different story. Modern education is just a way to train people to be good industrial and office workers. Higher ed should be about more. Sonny looked at him quizzically. Eric turned and propped up his feet on the bench, lounging. Think about it. K-12 is run like a factory with bells and shifts. Students learn to complete a task by rote, and those who produce the best ideal are valued the highest. It produced dependable factory workers. But now everyone works in the service industry. Right, and that's why we hear the mantra, you have to go to college all the time. One must have a BA to get, Eric's fingers made air quotes, a good job. But think about it. Universities used to be for the intellectual elites to learn how to research and make discoveries. Now they're degree mills. To be fair, it was mostly social elites, not intellectual elites. Yeah, okay, fair point. But what I mean to say is that if you want to educate good office workers, have them go to dedicated trade schools where they can learn basic business, management, and accounting principles, as well as necessary computer and math skills, save an entire generation from billions of student loan debt, and get us back to real education and research. Real education? Eric swiveled back around, putting both hands on the table. How did people learn before sedentary societies sprang up? Well, hunter-gatherer societies would have learned through trial and error, in small groups, from mentors. Right. And don't you think we've evolved to learn just that way? Hands-on and through discussions? What are most classes today? 
hands-off lectures. I see your point, but we couldn't educate everybody if it required so many teachers. Ah, but everybody can teach something. Spread the load around the community. Teach core competencies and more practical skills to boot. Bring back small group apprenticeships. It'd be easier if we weren't training for an industrial world anymore. Uh Uh-huh. Sonny looked at Eric out of the corner of his eye. Can I ask you something? Dave told me that you were acting a bit strained at the last conference. Actually, I heard it from a few people. They said you had gone off the deep end. Everyone's a little worried about you. Sonny paused. And the smile you have on your face right now is a little disconcerting. Through his manic grin, Eric told Sonny they had nothing to worry about. The whole thing has been blown out of proportion. After I gave my boilerplate presentation about last year's research, you know, when we usually say what our next steps will be, I simply said something like, I want to level with you. I feel silly telling you what we're doing next because we are presently stuck without funding, largely because I haven't been able to find a tenure-track job. Until the job market gets better, many projects will be facing this problem and our field will suffer. Hundreds of hardworking, smart, and capable archaeologists are no longer allowed to contribute. Sonny let out a long breath. You said that? Do you think it influenced your job prospects this year? I mean, you should have had more interviews. Eric threw up his hands. Hard to say, isn't it? I wasn't doing that well before then, and it hasn't gotten measurably better or worse since. But it was the truth, and it needed to be said. I feel like everybody's drinking the same Kool-Aid, and when I say, what the hell are we doing, everybody thinks I'm nuts. I think I'm at the same point. I'm just not sure what to do with myself. I know the feeling. My whole life, I've been goal-oriented. Graduate from high school, college, get into and through graduate school, finish the dissertation, find a tenure-track job, and so on. Sonny nodded in agreement. And now we're facing the fact that we won't reach that last goal. So now what? Exactly. I feel a lot of free-floating anxiety and wasn't sure what to do. I've applied at jobs at non-profits, for-profits, even some unconventional places with absolutely no luck. Let me guess. Sorry you're overqualified. To some extent, yes. In other cases, I didn't have the paper qualifications to get hired for jobs that I'd feel passionate about, like with some environmental group, even though we both know a lot about earth and environmental sciences. What are you thinking about doing now? This, said Eric, gesturing to his garden, chicken coop, beehives, and greenhouse. Well, this and writing. Oh, right. You're writing a new book? Wasn't it about utopias? Yep, an ethnology of them. I'm comparing utopias as an anthropologist as if I visited each one. Oh, so this is where this stuff is coming from? I mean, you're talking about some other world. Sort of. That's my writing project. I'm also part of another project. It's absolutely in the real world, and I was hoping to tell you about it, but not yet. It involves gardening, to some extent. Um, But for now, uh, hey, do you want to give me a hand? Yeah, sure. Uh, What, with this hole? Sonny gestured toward a staked-out square about four feet on a side and two feet deep. Uh Uh-huh. It's going to be a gray water micropond. Seriously? Isn't that where you recycle your wastewater? Yep, all the water but the toilet. Someday I'd like to tackle a composting toilet, but for now I'm rerouting all the sink and shower drains to exit here into this pond. I'm surprised the city doesn't care. Well, it isn't exactly legal here without permitting and a whole ream of forms, but I'm not too worried about it because they have so much more to deal with already. Plus, I'm putting in a valve that can revert everything back to the original sewer line. Then you just use the water for irrigation? Mostly yes. We'll grow some aquatic plants and keep a few small fish to eat the mosquito larvae. After Sonny had borrowed some work clothes, they spent an hour digging through the heavy St. Louis clay, talking about trends in archaeological research and overall academic job market. By the time they had finished and gotten down about four feet, they had worked up a sweat and were taking a break, drinking cold beer sitting on the porch with their clay-spattered clothing. I miss working outside, said Sonny. I think it helps keep me sane, said Eric. I usually try and spend half my day doing something physical and the other half writing, reading, or doing research. That sounds great. Too bad it isn't a paying gig. I guess that all depends, doesn't it? I grow a lot of our food and get a side income through writing and editing. I cook most of our meals from scratch, so the ingredients are cheap. I know what we're eating. But Lauren works. If she didn't, you wouldn't be able to do this. Yes, that's true, but I think we've fallen into a trap in the last few generations. Now we expect a family to have two incomes, and instead of doing things for themselves, people buy prepared foods, hire others to clean up after them, pay to send their kids to daycare, spending most or all of that second income just to pay others to do jobs they could do for themselves. This pulls people out of the house and away from friends and family for more hours each week. In the past, a single income could provide for a family. What if in the future we could have two people who worked half-time and spent the newfound free time doing things for themselves at home with their friends and family? I suppose it's seen as a luxury to have the time to do things yourself. It is. 
You commented on the bag of goodies I gave you? It's just everyday stuff, but because I have the nominal luxury of being underemployed, I have the time to do this work for myself. It's understandable that poor middle-class people, many of whom work full-time jobs, have such poor nutrition. It's cheap and easy. Who wants to work a full day and then come home and spend two hours making dinner from scratch? I don't really see much chance for change, though. We just got out of a recession. People are starting to breathe easier. Eric looked at him instead of responding. After a minute, he said it was time to start getting dinner ready. Sonny sensed that Eric wanted to change the subject, so they cleaned up their workspace before heading inside. Eric had insisted that Sonny have the first shower and asked him to use up their old soap. Once the gray water system was installed, he explained, they'd have to use more biodegradable options. Eric was pulling out the flour and yeast to get some dough rising. Even though he had warned Sonny about how hot the water was, he couldn't help smirking when he heard Sonny yelp and swear when he turned it on. Eric had installed a solar hot water heater that spring, and even now in the fall, the water was practically scalding. By the time Sonny was back in the kitchen, Eric was dropping the dough into a grease bowl to rise. You need to turn down your water heater, Sonny said. You know about half of domestic energy is used to heat water? Eric started explaining the heating system to Sonny, and in short order they were up on the roof inspecting the glass-covered box of serpentine pipes and tanks that made up the water heater. What about in the winter, Sonny asked. Only during long, cold snaps do we have to use a heater. And then it's a point-of-use heater, which only heats up the water as you need it. It doesn't hold 40 gallons at 120 degrees all day. It's pretty up here when the sun starts to set, isn't it? Sonny nodded. They sat on the roof, looking across the cityscape for a few minutes before heading back down. It was Eric's turn to shower, and Sonny headed out to the garden to collect greens and vegetables for the salad and pizza toppings. As he was reaching through the tomato vines, he heard a latch snap open and the clicking of a bicycle as Lauren pushed through the gate. Short brown hair poked out from under her helmet. Her black sleeveless shirt was slightly darker from sweat around the shoulder straps of her backpack. The shirt shirt off her full-sleeve arm tattoo of Lady Justice. Hey, Lauren, Sonny waved. Sonny, glad you made it. Let me put this bike away and I'll come say hi. She was out of the garage in a minute, making her way across the yard to where Sonny was bent, cutting lettuce. I'd give you a hug, but I'm a bit sweaty from the ride home. No problem, he started. Hey, Lauren, how you doing? said a voice over the fence. Lauren looked up to see their neighbor leaning on his porch, drinking a beer. Hey, Eddie, how's it going? Good, you know, I can't complain. Garden looks good this year. Yeah, Eric's been busy. Well, when the shit hits the fan, I know where I'm going to come to get some food. That's true enough. Do you want something? The carrots are looking really good right now, she said as she stooped down and pulled out a bunch. Eddie held out his hands, palms forward. What? Hell no, I'm not eating those. They were in the ground. Don't you like carrots? No, I love carrots, but I get my other grocery store. I'll take some okra, though. You can always trust some okra. Lauren snipped two dozen pods and handed them over the fence. Eddie thanked her and took his windfall inside. He's nice enough, Lauren said, but I worry about the state of our education system where people are afraid of fresh carrots. Sonny nodded, smiling. Where is Eric, anyway? He left you here working? I had the first shower. He's up there now. Oh, really? asked Lauren, almost gleefully. Did he show you the solar hot water heater? Sonny nodded. Watch this, said Lauren as she climbed the stairs to the second story of their deck. This is the main output valve, she said as she closed it. She started counting down from five and had just reached one when they both heard the screams coming from the bathroom window. What the hell? Ah, welcome home, honey. Look out, she called. I'm turning it back on. And then to Sonny. I'm going to get changed. By the time he had finished in the garden, Eric was back downstairs, giving the dough a quick knead. Mushrooms? Sonny nodded. They're downstairs in the basement. Grab a couple bottles of beer or cider from the cellar while you're down there. The stout came out okay this year. Dave was here for a week and helped me figure out what I'd been doing wrong on the first batches. Sonny plucked a bowl full of mushrooms from the decomposing heap of plant matter in a plastic tub at the bottom of the basement stairs. He looked through the cellar and its rows of cans, containers of dehydrated fruits and vegetables, and hanging herbs before finding the bottles near the back. Sonny made his way back up the stairs. That's quite the store of food you've put up. It's the fullest in the fall, so you're seeing it's at its best. It looks pretty paltry by the late spring. Are you even applying for jobs anymore? You seem pretty comfortable as things are. Lauren smiled. It's more important to get everything ready now before... Eric was seized by a coughing fit, and he pointed to the sink. Water! Sonny caught Eric shaking his head at Lauren while he turned to the faucet. Eric drank the whole glass in one go. Uh, no, I I do some part-time work and help folks with building things for their garden, but for the most part, it's just as busy doing as much for ourselves as we can. Sounds nice. I've got an idea, said Lauren. Why not call Kate and have her come down on the train tomorrow? Stay for a few days. Sonny molded over for a minute. I do have some vacation time, and she has a lull in her work right now. She could bring some extra clothes and a few books. Yeah, I'll give her a call. Not much later, the three were out in the backyard again, watching the fire in the brick pizza oven Eric had built as an experiment with brick arches, he claimed. The neighborhood houses, and most of St. Louis for that matter, were also made of brick. 
From the porch, they could see the back alley, the grass-covered backyards of the neighborhood, and the tangled mass of wires strung from every house. Although they could not see it, they could hear the steady drone of cars half a block away on the major thoroughfare, which, from the 1920s to the completion of the interstate system, had been part of Route 66. The only noise that competed with the cars was the barking of dogs. So what is going on, asked Sunny. You're up to something, and you clearly don't want to talk about it, so let's get it over with. Eric and Lauren glanced at one another. Well, said Eric, it started about a year ago on a hiking trip. A few of us have been talking about the major dangers facing the world in the coming decades. Just out of curiosity, what would you list as the top three systemic threats? Let's see. Long term, I'd say the biggest threat is a changing climate. Then it would be hmm, uh, built-in economic and social inequality. And finally, Sony paused, furrowing his brows. I guess I'd say narcissism. Eric and Lauren, who had been nodding along with his answers, started giggling. Narcissism? asked Lauren. Yeah, selfishness and the obsession everybody seems to have with themselves instead of their community, friends, and family. Your points, said Eric, line up with what we talked about last year. We also decided to do something about it, and I thought you and Kate would be useful people to have working with us. What are you thinking? Eric and Lauren exchanged glances again. Let's put it this way. If you were the benevolent dictator of the world and wanted to design a society that had sustainable survival at its root, what would it look like? As he spoke, he brushed the coals off the fire bricks in the center of the oven, picked up a wooden peel from the nearby table, and slid the pizzas off into the oven with a snap of his wrist. Sonny sat for a minute and then said, Well, I suppose we'd have to learn to live without fossil fuels, adapt our subsistence practices to a warmer world with more intense extremes and storms, and overall our economic system and culture to one where one prospers when everyone prospers. Nice. That's pretty much where we stand. So then the question becomes, given our current state, how do we get there in time? Oh, short of a concurrent collapse of the entire developed world's infrastructure? Sonny laughed, looking from Eric to Lauren, who were smiling. If it happens over a week in the near future, would that be concurrent enough for you? asked Lauren. Sonny stopped laughing and stared at his friends. That's the second project I'm working on, said Eric. Have you heard of the eco-gorillas? Vaguely. There's something, there was something on the news a while back? We call ourselves the Deep Greens, and we just put our reviews in a 20,000-word manifesto last summer. And we got contacted by Knowledge Monday on NPR to come on and talk about it. Who is this, you and Lauren? No, answered Lauren. A few of us started it last year, mostly academics and like-minded folks here in St. Louis. But we've been recruiting. Before we go any further, though, we need you to agree to keep this to yourself. Oh yeah, of course. Eric continued, it's not that easy, Sonny. What you already know could get us into trouble. You've got two options right now. Join up or keep this between us. What does it involve? I don't want to agree before knowing what I'm getting into. That's reasonable, Lauren said, but we can't tell you much more before you're in. It will involve illegal activities and sabotage. It will not involve us hurting anyone directly nor violence against people, just property crimes and psychological warfare. And the end goal? A livable world that is one that's livable for the long term, not just for us, but for everything. What will that look like? Eric walked to the oven and turned the pizzas. We'd like to leave it up to communities to decide but we'll have to decentralize the large cities, spread out more evenly across the landscape. Once we have human-scaled communities, they can decide for themselves how to organize themselves within the limits of self-sufficient, low-impact living. Sonny let out a low whistle. Jesus, can I think about it? Yeah, of course, said Lauren. Can we give you a copy of the manifesto to read, since that's public, but we'd prefer that you give us an answer before you leave. What about Kate? She's welcome, of course. We thought it best to talk to you first, and if you decide to join us, you can talk to Kate, or, or we can. Okay, fine. Give me a copy of this thing and I'll read it after dinner. The pizza smells awesome and I'm getting hungry. With that, they pulled the pizza, whose cheese was bubbling over a deeply brown crust, out of the oven and started eating. The topic had changed to Kate's new art installation and her freelance grant writing. After polishing off the pizza, the salad, and a bowl of fruit for dessert, Lauren went into the house while Eric was building up the fire. He explained they liked to sit around it as the evening cooled. But before long, Lauren had come back with her hands full. Scotch, three stacked glasses, Eric's pipe, and one of his current books, her knitting, and a bound printout of the manifesto. Lauren doled out the items and sat down. She unstacked the glasses, dropping an ice cube in each one, and poured out a bit of scotch. Sonny took his glass. Thanks. I was distracted all dinner thinking about this, so I'm glad for a bit of time to read it now. Take your time, said Eric. Hurry up, said Lauren. Choice is mine, Sonny said, modifying the Nirvana lyrics. The three smiled and settled in. The brightness of the red brick houses faded with the setting sun, and they were left with the dancing flames, porch lights, barking dogs, and racing cars. Chapter 6, 1.2 The Precepts in Action 
These are simple concepts, but they have profound implications for our everyday lives. NAS articulated a list of character traits, adapted below, that we hope to cultivate in our society. Note, NAS, 1995A, end of note. These are not meant to be rules, but examples of how one might live according to the precepts outlined above. 1.2.1. A meaningful life of simplicity. Keep it simple. Reach goals in the most straightforward way possible. Millions of years ago, plants died, decomposed, and became peat. That peat was buried and became oil. Today that oil is pumped out of the ground, heated until it becomes a gas, condensed into plastic, and turned into a bag that is used for 20 minutes before being thrown away, only to sit in a landfill for a thousand years where it can release toxins and choke animals. Is this really the simplest way to carry groceries? This is just one of thousands of ways we build unnecessary complications into our lives. We have grown so accustomed to this complication that we see it as mundane and benign, but this couldn't be further from the truth. When faced with the decision, ask yourself, what is the simplest, least wasteful way to reach your goal? Choose activities that have intrinsic values and avoid those that are merely diversions. We should recognize an inherent difference between activities done with a responsible purpose and those done as a mere distraction. Traveling to accomplish a task is different from joyriding. Catching a fish for dinner differs from sport fishing. Growing a vegetable garden is not the same as maintaining a pristine grass lawn. We live in such abundance that we create new problems and goals to keep ourselves busy. Although too many people work hard to provide for their basic needs, more still earn enough money to spend on leisure pursuits and status symbols. We have become so used to the regular availability of food and the relative safety we enjoy that we take these things for granted. The myriad things we have invented to occupy our time and absorb any extra income have become perceived as necessities when in fact they are a drain on our common resources. When deciding how to spend your time, think of activities related to eating, socializing, or taking care of yourself or your loved ones. Let us attempt to live in a meaningful way and not just fill the hours by being busy. Or, as Thoreau put it, we, quote, should not play life or study it merely while the community supports us at this expensive game, but earnestly live it from beginning to end. End quote. Note. Thoreau, 1971, page 51. End of note. We are constantly inundated with distractions. We invite intrusions into our life. Our smartphones beep every time a friend from high school posts a picture of her lunch. We lose sight of the big picture because we are bogged down in the minutia. We can derive pleasure from many things, but so often we choose to spend our time completing fruitless tasks. Americans average 34 hours of television weekly. Globally, 3 billion hours of computer and video games are played each week. Deriving enjoyment from these things is not bad in and of itself, but as the world grinds towards social and ecological crisis, we should learn creativity, cooperation, and hand-eye coordination from real-world activities that create tangible byproducts. Minecraft, for example, is an immensely popular game in which players are able to use their imagination to build novel objects and buildings. A generation ago, children built forts and knickknacks from resources they found around them. Only in the latter game would children learn real-world physical skills, even though both games are essentially the same idea. Look for in-depth and richness of experience rather than intensity. Appreciate and choose, whenever possible, meaningful work rather than just making a living. Enjoy the soreness in your muscles after turning your garden over instead of using a motorized tiller. Handmade goods and food are twice as valuable as store-bought. You enjoy them once as you make them and a second time as you consume them. Travel by foot or bicycle may be slower, but it gives more time for enjoying the world. It's no coincidence that high-paying occupations are either odious or require great skill and training. If fossil fuel jobs did not pay well, people would find other ways of making a living that didn't contend their children to a bleak future. Corporate officers are well compensated because they must put the interests of their stakeholders above the safety of their workers and customers. Many people are lucky enough to have a choice in what jobs they perform, and we should have a society that examines the total contribution of a person's effort, not just the amount of money he or she earns. Too many must work less than desirable jobs for low pay just to survive in our current system, but they can find other ways to contribute meaningfully to their friends, family, and community. Lead a complex but not complicated life, cultivating as many experiences as possible. For example, it's currently cheaper and easier to buy ready-made products than to make them at home. But for the superficial ease of this lifestyle, we add layers of complication to our lives and minimize our perceived responsibility for the chain of production. We can gain a sense of personal fulfillment and accomplishment from making things. It takes more time, effort, and skill, and often the final outcome is less than ideal in the beginning. But it can be a more positive experience than simply purchasing some anonymous product. In many other ways, we can reform our lives to replace complication with complexity while increasing our positive experiences and minimizing the negative ones. 
1.2.2 Careful Consumption We should work to avoid consumerism, overconsumption, and superfluous personal property. Decade after decade, the average American possesses more stuff. Our houses have been getting bigger to accommodate this increase in possessions. Many kitchens, for example, have a variety of gadgets that perform a single task. Granted, a food processor, garlic press, pizza slicer, apple core, banana slicer, and corn kernel remover may all perform their tasks admirably, but a single chef's knife and cutting board can perform the same tasks almost as well. Our closets bulge with clothing, much of which is produced in slave labor-like conditions. The main reason why we can have so many garments so cheaply. We own so many articles of clothing that we get rid of them when fashions change, well before they wear out from use. Try to maintain and appreciate common items so that everyone's needs can be met. We have been taught that we live in a world ruled by the maxim, survival of the fittest, something we'll dispute later. One of the things that sets humans apart from other animals is that we have replaced physical competition with cognition. We use weapons, tools, and our brains to best other animals and humans instead of fighting with our hands and teeth. As direct physical competition for resources has declined in the industrial world, we have created other guises to demonstrate our fitness, both physical and social. We use sports and other competitions to showcase our physical prowess. We display our wealth and taste with expensive objects and social behavior. We must, however, get over the idea of besting our fellow beings and instead focus on encouraging everything to live up to its potential. This includes people, other animals, and even plants. One way that we can manifest this ideal is by taking only what is a fair share. By taking more of a finite resource than you can comfortably consume, you may be depriving someone or something else of what it needs to survive. One way to reduce our consumption is to avoid neophilia, the love of new things, and cherish well-worn items. Note, NAS 1995A, page 260, discusses novophilia, but neophilia is more widely used and entomologically consistent. End of note. In a world of abundance, we have to create scarcity. Each year, hordes of people clamor to exchange their year-old smartphones for the newest model. Fashions change faster than we can wear out clothing, requiring the purchase of new items to be in. Car companies invent new creature comforts that we never knew we needed because basic automobile design hasn't changed in decades. As children, we learn to ostracize those who are not up to date with the current trends in music, movies, or clothing. Instead of producing goods that last, companies build cheaply and make a second profit when their products require inevitable replacement. Instead of repairing something that is damaged, we throw it out. We must hold up the ideal of having a few well-built, long-lasting items instead of many cheap disposable ones. We must reorient our society's value system to prize the heirloom, avoid the derivative, and still remember that these are just things. We can also participate in and cultivate an appreciation of primary production, such as small-scale agriculture, forestry, and fishing. For a generation or more, most of us in the first world have been divorced from the production of anything we consume. From food and shelter to clothing and transportation, we purchase ready-made products. Even modern farmers do not eat their own produce. We can start small by cooking meals from scratch, repairing worn-out clothing, or starting a small garden. Sometimes these skills require patience and training, but the benefits will outweigh the costs over time, especially as the system supplying the ready-made products collapses. We must recognize the difference between vital needs and desires. Our society has trained us to shop for fun while ignoring the needs of others. Everybody will be better off when we reduce our sheer number of possessions in favor of the old, much worn but essentially well-kept things. With the abundance of products and the superabundance of calories available to most people today, many have become insulated from true want. This is not meant to diminish the tribulations of disadvantaged people across the world, but to make the point that people with even moderate wealth simply have to choose how their needs will be met and rarely have to truly make hard choices between necessities. Our society equates consumption with status, and this will be a difficult habit to break, but we can choose to do it now or have it done for us later. Food is a vital need, but how we fulfill this need must be examined closely. Meat eating goes back hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years into our shared history. Physiologically, our bodies are well equipped to consume meat. We can, however, be perfectly healthy consuming only plant-based foods. Too often meat is taken for granted and we do not think about its origins. Modern meat consumption is not sustainable as it takes an immense amount of resources to raise, slaughter, preserve, and prepare industrial meat. If you had to raise, kill, butcher, and prepare the meat you ate, would you eat it as often? Or at all? If you are uncomfortable with the thought of killing and eating an animal, perhaps you should consider what you are asking others to do so that you can continue to consume meat, pretending that it appears by magic in the supermarket.
The economic and resource costs associated with eating meat are described in detail below, but in general, we should think carefully about the foods we eat, where it comes from, and what sorts of externalized costs are associated with its production. The shorter the chain of consumption, the better off every involved organism will be. While some diets will always contain meat, each person must carefully examine his or her own consumption. 1.2.3. Build Communities we must support the building of communities instead of societies. The Industrial Revolution changed many aspects of our daily lives, and while most would credit it with growing our material wealth, fewer recognize the impact it has had on social relations. In 1887, Ferdinand Tunis noted the development of urban industrial Gesellschaften, or societies, as people left their rural, close-knit Gemeinschaften, or communities. While the former are based on common interests, the root Gesell means fellow, the latter grow out of personal relationships, the root gemein means common. As we recognize that we are one of many species on this planet, we must also accept that we are a part of a community and our actions affect others. No one is an isolated island onto him or herself. Perhaps we can create real Gemeinschaften in urban areas, but it's likely to be easier in smaller communities where people know one another. In either case, our focus when interacting with others should be to cultivate community rather than simple transactional associations. Every society around the world has developed a way of life that fits into their surroundings. Each community is an experiment in living, and everyone has something to contribute. Western and American cultures have been exported to many parts of the world, where they disrupt well-functioning indigenous lifeways. This causes two problems. First, industrial living is unsustainable for the one-fifth of the world that currently uses it, let alone for all seven billion and counting people on the planet. Second, industrial society suppresses all alternative ways of life that may hold the key for our survival as a species. Because fossil fuels will run out, it is the first world that must learn how to survive from the third world. Note, we avoid the terms developed and undeveloped world because it makes so-called development appear as an aspirational goal of the rest of the world, which it neither is nor should be. End of note. One of the best ways to appreciate and understand the similarities and differences among humans is to travel, but we must be careful to move between communities in responsible, sustainable ways. See section 1.2.16. We should have concern about how the third world lives and avoid gross inequalities in our own lives. We do not all need to live the same way, and our revolution is not bent on forcing everyone to become a hunter-gatherer. Everybody in the world lives on a spectrum. On one end are those who have minimal infrastructure, possessions, and environmental impact. On the other end are those who live in the extreme opulence of industrialized society. The distribution of this spectrum on a graph shows most people living in a modest, sedentary life, while only a few live in an exorbitant fashion. By averaging these lifestyles, or at least removing the extremists at the top, we can ensure that everybody has access to adequate shelter. In the industrialized world, this would require repairing and maintaining existing buildings and only creating new structures out of renewable or permanent materials, such as wood or stone. It means using fuels and other resources at sustainable levels that is averaged across the global community. We must act resolutely and without cowardice and conflicts, but remain nonviolent against living organisms, human or otherwise. One thing that sets us apart from those who continue to ignore science and destroy the world is that we value life. In our fight to create a more sustainable world, we cannot lose sight of the fact that we support the right of every living thing to reach its potential, and this means an absolute insistence on nonviolent resolutions. We are not advocating pacifism, as a single aggressor can too easily dominate when he or she has no resistance. Many nonviolent options can be used against aggression, especially when a majority of the population is committed to nonviolent resistance. Furthermore, aggression tends to stem from an inequality in resources or a drive for status. By working to level resource distribution and awarding social status to positive, pro-social activities, we can change the way people think about getting ahead. Furthermore, a distinction can be made between violence and necessary killing. It's not a violent act to eat plants or animals per se, but the manner of harvest must avoid inflicting more pain than necessary on animals. While supporting nonviolence, we can still participate in direct actions when all else fails. Property destruction, especially property that is causing harm to others, is not outside the bounds of acceptable nonviolent behavior. Actions must be designed to avoid harming living things, either directly or indirectly. In this case, harm refers to endangering something's chance of survival, not protecting non-essential possessions. Although destruction may appear to be a loss, on the larger scale it may be for the better. For example, destroying fossil fuel infrastructure may cause immediate inconvenience, but it contributes to our long-term survival. 
we can respect life even when destroying property. 1.2.4. Respect for the wild. We can attempt to live in nature rather than just visiting beautiful places, and we can decide to travel responsibly. Travel enables and encourages us to learn about the world. Without travel, we would not have Darwin's theory of evolution. Our experiences would be confined to a small world of limited ideas. Excessive travel, though, especially for business or status-seeking tourism to remote and sensitive areas such as Antarctica, is hard on the world. Furthermore, our sequestration in buildings and urban areas where organic growth is fettered reinforces the divide between humans and the rest of the world. Living within or having an occupation that deals with a non-industrial ecosystem will change anyone's point of view. The rest of the world is no longer seen as separate when one spends most of his or her time, quote-unquote, out in nature. When we are in vulnerable ecosystems, we should tread lightly. We have all seen areas that are at risk. Old-growth forests, coral reefs, freshwater lakes, rainforests, coasts, the Arctic, and so on. Part of accepting our place in this world is recognizing how our actions affect ecosystems. Most of us are happy to protect quote-unquote nature when we are visiting a park or hiking through the wilderness by leaving no trace, but it is more difficult to reform our overall way of life even though we recognize that the global ecosystem is vulnerable. We must break down the artificial barrier we think exists between humans and nature. Part of respecting the world is a tendency to appreciate all life forms rather than merely those considered beautiful, remarkable, or narrowly useful. We should not view animate beings merely as a means to an end. Every organism has intrinsic value and dignity, whether or not we use them as resources. When the interests of anthropocentric species, for example dogs, cats, and domesticated plants, come into conflict with wild species, we should respect the rights of the latter. For example, wolves were hated and feared in the American West. They were systemically hunted and driven out of inhabited areas as they were only seen as a threat to humans and livestock. Their role as hunters of wild ungulates, for example deers, antelope, and elk, and lagomorphs, for example rabbits and hares, was underappreciated. After they had been eradicated, prey populations soared and farmers felt a different impact of wild animals on their crops. It's hard for us to appreciate the role played by species that we do not consider to be beneficial to humans. Yet in many cases we seek to destroy animals we later come to understand as vital for preserving the local ecosystem. We should not judge whether or not a species has the right to exist because we have proved to be too short-sighted. We should work to protect local ecosystems, not just the life form we deem to be beneficial. Not because it benefits us, although it does, but because we are just part of that ecosystem, not its master. Furthermore, we can deplore excessive interference in nature as unnecessary, unreasonable, and disrespectful, and condemn it as insolent, atrocious, outrageous, and criminal without condemning the people responsible for the interference. Yes, part of being human is modifying the landscape around us. For example, hunter-gatherers burned grasses and forests to encourage new growth that brought out deer and other species they preferred to hunt. But it is incumbent on us to think carefully about how we modify that landscape. When selecting trees to harvest for lumber to build a new house, we might look at selecting only a few trees out of a forest instead of clear-cutting a smaller area. We will impact our surroundings simply by being alive. That is unavoidable. But by considering the natural cycles around us, we can attempt to fit ourselves into a pre-existing framework instead of letting our id dominate. End of Episode 3 of Eco-Gorillas. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. <laughs>